Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Texas Blockcast. We're here with my friend Joe Kelly, the co-founder and CEO of Unchained Capital, a great Texas Bitcoin company. Joe, thanks for coming on the show. Pleasure to be here, Lee. Good to see you, man. So we're going to talk a lot about Texas in this interview, but first let's talk about Unchained um, and and kind of the history of it. This is not a new company, right? You guys have been at this for several years. Uh, so give the viewers a little bit of the background on how it got started and um, y'all's differentiation with the non-custodial financial products that you offer to um, uh, to your clients. Sure, gladly. Yes, Unchained really started with the idea that Bitcoin is here to stay and that the long term holders of Bitcoin are folks that will uh, over time, you want the benefit of traditional financial services, but they're going to want to consume them or use them in a neat, unique way. That means they might want uh, a, a particular flavor of a, of a financial partner, not that's non traditional, less traditional than like a Fidelity or their um, large bank. And as well, due to the te technological nature of Bitcoin and how it's secured, how it's custodied, uh, you know, a lot of our early thesis was that there's going to be a new way to design your financial partner and design your experience when you uh, work with a financial provider in Bitcoin. So that's something that's really been uh, true for Unchained uh, really since the beginning. You know, we started in 2016. Our first product was a Bitcoin secured loan. Uh, we were the first folks to, I think, be giving loans publicly for Bitcoin as collateral to individuals. And then as well, we innovated by uh, enabling clients to hold a key uh, within the multi-sig address for how their Bitcoin is secured. So one way you can really know that your Bitcoin is not rehypothecated and um, it's going to remain in the same place you put it for the duration of your loan. That we've since expanded from then. We have a uh, standalone uh, vault offering. Clients can hold their own keys to their Bitcoin for the long run in a way that we've helped facilitate. We help kind of walk them into using that comfortably. Um, and a lot of people are thinking about you know, when they're securing Bitcoin for the long term is inheritance. How do they ensure this passes on to um, their spouse or other multiple generations? So being that financial services partner that can walk them through that walk any inheritors through how they access Bitcoin, how they access funds. And it's again, always trying to preserve that idea of Bitcoin. Uh, it's, it's when it's, a, and it's most valuable, it's, it's useful in a way that you can use it without needing someone else. So you're, you don't need an intermediary. So always trying to preserve that aspect of uh, Bitcoin and our financial products. So we'll give loans. We can love, give lo dollar loans against Bitcoin. Clients can hold their own keys to Bitcoin in an IRA. They can use their vault products we mentioned. And we also buy sell for clients. So really trying to be a, full suite financial services experience for that long-term Bitcoin holder. Nice. Uh, so the TBC, we've obviously been a long-term client. We've hosted, or not hosted, but we have uh, used Unchained's uh, multi-sig vault to, um, to secure our Bitcoin with, with a two of three arrangement. Uh, and that's been really great. I mean, we, we're even now connecting that with Hoseki to do like a public disclosure proof of reserves of the TBC's Bitcoin. Um, reserves meager such that they are um uh, but we still we still are wanting to kind of exercise those muscles and, and understand how the, that all it works so uh say say that i'm talking to somebody in dallas um or austin or, or wherever i am and they are a family office they have you know maybe some you know amount of bitcoin more than one less than a thousand kind of in that range uh, so they obviously are, are a, a hodler and, and a long-term holder. What would be the first product that you suggest to them? Would it be the the multi-sig vault uh, arrange that you guys offer with um, uh, hardware oh, yeah. wallets? That's generally how our client relationships start uh, these days. We, we have had a lot of success with our IRA product. People come in for those or um, you know, people might trade with us for the first time uh, as one of their, their early experiences with us. But um, really the standalone vault offering. And if you're a family office and yeah, you can purchase your Bitcoin through us if you don't have it. So you might have some holdings somewhere already. Um, the vault offering is is great for, especially those organizational contexts where you do want to have multiple controls inside the business. You might have uh, different individuals holding keys or different individuals playing a role in the, uh, the access and the transacting uh, around the Bitcoin. Uh, and what we really specialize in, one of the things that differentiates Unchained and adds a lot of value to clients is that that onboarding experience concierge onboarding team um, that really help provide that white glove service that hand holding uh, whether an individual or that family office or an operating business um, you get some expert that will do video calls with you spend an hour sometimes two if needed um, to initialize any harbor wallets 
to uh, walk you through your on-chain vault experience, show you how things work, get you comfortable, help you even walk through your first deposit. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes self-custody can be intimidating. Uh, give you keys, hardware wallets, what are these things? What do I do with my backups? Um, how where should I keep these these artifacts? Uh, so having that expert that you can talk to and walk you through everything is something that really is, is valuable part of the experience. We do charge for it, but um, you know, in the context of uh, our services, it's you know mostly a cost plus kind of a charge. Yeah, yeah, I remember it being incredibly reasonable. Um, so you you mentioned that you can buy Bitcoin through Unchain, right? So from what I last saw, it was a five thousand dollar minimum. Minimum. I'm sure the upward bound is is much higher than that, million dollars maybe. Um, is that still the the minimum? Is it kind of the bound there? Is five thousand minimum, or have you all changed that recently? We have reduced this to two thousand dollars. So uh, yeah, and we'll, and we'll work on there'll be other you know lowerings of minimums and other ways. Right now, the the uh, way folks purchase Bitcoin is through a wire. Um, wire funds in, and the, part of the feature or the benefit for folks that are buying. Bitcoin through Unchain rather than on exchanges is that instant settlement that comes from kind of both having funded through a wire, which we receive funds of immediately. Uh, but then when that when you when we settle the Bitcoin, that Bitcoin gets settled and sent to your vault. So you can have that kind of same day within 24 hour uh, full settlement of uh, a Bitcoin purchase you make through Unchain, which is really kind of a, an experience I, I don't think you can get quite anywhere else. You're really, the funds are tied up for five days on Coinbase while your ACH clears or um, you know, it's, it's, it's a sitting with the counterparty before you can really um, move it out or withdraw it. Uh, so that that literally that coupled experience that uh, reduces the risk for clients is is a key feature for us. Yeah, because when I think about that, I guess you guys never take custody of a client a client's Bitcoin, right? Is it you know as soon as the wire hits, the Bitcoin is transferred to their wallet? Yeah, I mean maybe there's some technical sense in which there's an hour or two or something like that. Like we're you know, owing, you know, Bitcoin that that's out, but that, you know, that transaction yeah, after the wire hits for a valid, um, you know, uh, uh, trade with a the client, then that kicks off the process to, to settle the Bitcoin. Mm, okay. Uh, yeah, we don't have any custodial balances of Bitcoin for clients. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a key differentiator. I mean, we've, we've obviously been making some waves recently at the TBC with this new uh, legislation that would require more transparency of proof of reserves for exchanges doing business in Texas. But you and I were just talking before um, this this interview about how that's a key differentiator for you guys. Yeah, yeah, for us, and, and something that's kind of been there in the beginning and has really helped and um, even for just a regulatory strategy, we're never ones to avoid or try to cheat any kind of regulations when um, when they become necessary or are, are clearly part of what you need. And that comes, for instance, like we've done KYC and AML since the very beginning. Um, but when it comes to delivering the kind of service we do, given we're not sitting on Bitcoin for clients, um, you know, and, a, and a strong, you have a strong argument for why you should be exempted from a lot of what legislations uh, and, and rulemaking is done to protect consumers. Because you're trying to protect a consumer who may have assets sitting with a the young company or even sort of older company and that um, they may uh, be able to do things or, you know, reinvest those, those assets or those holdings that they're sitting on for clients um, and, uh, and then potentially lose those or like not have good uh, security practices for how those are, are kept or good controls internally or people that are liable for, for something that might happen with the client uh, balance. So yeah, we, we occupy this really unique niche and just how we can um, you know, kind of be exempt from a lot of those kinds of uh, rules and, um, that that's due to the nature of our model. I think it's something that you can only really exist within the context of Bitcoin. You know, when you're, you're purchasing a share of Apple, you're not necessarily getting that settled to a thing you control. It's, you know, it's sitting with a layer of counterparties and, um, you know, longer settlement windows. Uh, so this, this idea of being that kind of really Bitcoin first, Bitcoin native financial institution, uh, it's something quite empowering for both us as a business, but also individuals and consumers. Uh, I think that's something we like to focus on when we're educating regulators and we're you know, speaking to legislatures um, is highlighting what uh, what you can do with this technology and, and making sure that people know and understand and don't look at just like what happened with FTX or these big centralized counterparties that went up in flames last year um, and as they tend to do, but that uh, that there are other services like Unchained that we think do things right, do things correctly, um, kind of lead the way or show and try to show uh, the market and show clients um, how you can work with a financial provider safely. Talk a little bit more about that very thing, about the pressure that maybe you guys have felt over the last couple of years 
uh, as a Bitcoin only um, business where you, you may have left some some short term profits on the table, but uh, you're you're focused on the long term. Yeah, I'd say early on, uh, you know, we you know, launching with Bitcoin was a clear choice. It was a, a very, very easy uh, commitment to make. And we did, in fact, in you know, part of our history is we, we supported Ethereum for uh, a little under a year. Um, that's as collateral for loans. And that, that took a lot of effort. There's a lot of technical effort that went into that. It made our team uncomfortable with how kind of unstable some of the infrastructure was there and what it took to develop a, a smart contract we thought we could be comfortable with. Um, but at the end of the day, it was never also really that much of a market success, not anything that um, really put much of a, a dent into our loan book or was, was never a major piece of, of our business. And so that yeah, told us a couple of things. It told us that there's probably not a lot of ROI in supporting other things, so just from a pure business rationale. Um, and as well, that the, the risk, we were just kind of uncomfortable with that. Um, so maintaining the focus as a, as a team, as an organization on Bitcoin, um, I think it's really helped you know, solidify our culture, solidify our uh, our market and who we who we actually appeal to and who we want to work with and build a uh, loyal client base with. Um, so there's just a there's a sound business decision to that. Um, as well, there's I think you know first principles, philosophical, good reasons to expect that Bitcoin is the you're going to be a reserve currency of the future. It is going to be that foundation on which you can you know dependably, even though there's a lot of volatility and variance in the, the price of it, um, and uh, bear and bull markets are uh, can be quite wild. That it's still a, a long-term trend line and long-term place to to build a business, and we get stronger uh, every year that we're in business. We get um, better and better at how we deliver uh, services to clients, and so we expect the the bull markets and the um, the good times to get better and better. And the bear markets or times that are not so active in client you know, loans and trading that those will be those will always kind of reset at a higher basis. So um, I kind of want to you know, maybe cover one or two, but, you know. And I think just as well that the kind of principles that operate within Bitcoin again about um, how important you know or how much clients kind of value keys and holding keys. I think that was another kind of signal or why you know for instance within the um, uh, the, the Ethereum version of our product there wasn't the same market penetration. There wasn't the same like kind of pickup or um, uh, you know client interest within Bitcoin. It's it's kind of always been there. There's that kind of core idea within the community of uh, sovereignty of holding your own keys and its importance. Um, so that's always resonated. Um, and so, so there's a lot of aspects of why that's, that's made sense. Other things about our business, you know, like the, the lack of rehypothecation, I want to say that was another big one that had us, you know, you get the VC pressure, investor pressure, or others that you're out talking to the market, or you are supporting more coins and kind of with their logic there, but also like, why aren't you, you know, lending out the collateral you're taking from, mm. from clients? Um, you know, that was, we did deliberate a lot. Uh, I think we had a really solid, uh, team, you know, throughout our history that, um, you know, a lot of the perspective that kind of came out in the end is just too risky um, that you you are taking someone else's asset and you are lending it out and you're lending it out into a market that's you know as we as we've seen now with how these things are going it's very interconnected it's very opaque incestuous um, at times that's for us yeah yeah crazily so right yeah just like what a um uh it's like yeah all, all the retail outlets that were doing this from a Voyager to a BlockFi to anyone, they're all lending the same people that are then lending the same people. It's like really something that, that you know, those dominoes um, were all quite close to each other. And so, um, you know, I, I wish I could say we went, we look, looked at every balance sheet or like, you know, we came up like, it was just for us a, a very surface level, you know, uh, factor, like kind of an obvious fact of like, hey, this is just not a market that you um, should feel comfortable putting client assets out into. And it, that did mean, you know, our loan interest rates would be higher. Didn't mean that we, you know, had to turn down business and we turned down, you know, even some of those funds and people that would come to us trying to borrow Bitcoin. Um, and so it was just, you know, one of those, those kind of sounder decisions we made that really helped us as well, kind of weather um, the storms last year and, and come out looking really strong. You know, being a lender, you'd still trust um, in a place that, you know, the, the observation I think is very poignant too. It's like, a lot of those places, as they're as a Bitcoin price is crashing, as the client's collateral value is declining, they're getting margin calls. And so, if you're getting margin calls from BlockFi last summer, are you are you really wanting to cover? Are you really want to post more Bitcoin into that black box? Like it just doesn't sound like you don't know that you want to trust that. You don't know what that um, the outcome of sending more Bitcoin into that scenario is going to look like. Unchained with this kind of this really this strongly segregated idea. You know, that the collateral is always the clients and it remains in the, the box, the place it was put in at the start of the loan. 
you can always feel comfortable popping up on your margin calls. You can always feel comfortable putting more Bitcoin in there and you know, keeping uh, the loan safe, protecting your principal um, and not losing uh, further coins. So just these kind of sounder business practices that come out of uh, trying to do things right in the long perspective. Um, and it may not always be the shiniest, um, uh, biggest logo in the block in some periods, but it's a it's a sound model and you know builds a lot of trust with their clients. Yeah, it does. And as I think through when your loan book is going to expand, it's probably going to be in those bull market times where people have uh, Bitcoin that's appreciated quite a bit and they have particularly high capital gains liabilities were they to decide to sell. So they're probably going to hold. Um, yeah. And then they need cash for some sort of life event or to start a business or buy a house or what have you. Um, and then that's I could see that becoming like a pretty significant driver in those. But the inverse is true in the bear market uh, where those tax situations are, are not there or maybe are reversed. Um, is it as stark as it as, as I'm making it sound or is it a little bit more level leveled off? Yeah, I think overall, I mean, uh, on an entire ecosystem basis, um, I mean, across the board, there's always more you know, economic tech activity, transactions, and then your know, bottom line revenue uh, hitting firms when it's when it's a bull market. Um, that can, you know, the basis is higher, the um, the dollar value per Bitcoin is higher, um, and people are more apt to transact both by getting in and by sometimes other maybe selling or taking a look to observe. And that in the end, that that behavior. Um, you know, we observe comes out of uh, some of the similar reasons you mentioned. Higher, uh, you know, now, now my, my Bitcoin's worth now several million dollars. Like that, that sounds like a capital base out of which I'd like to do something, purchase something, you know, make an investment. Um, and so you're inclined to do that. Uh, and likewise, as you say, that the tax uh, implications of, of selling Bitcoins you know, might, might frighten you. Um, the the cushioning effect, you know, you do see long term holders that some that are wise, you know, also know that like. I'm taking a loan here at what might be a perceived bottom. Um, I'm less likely to get margin called. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. At those at those those bull market peaks, then you know, they face margin calls on the way down. Um, that was something that we did. We were the first lender to do this in uh, January, February of 2021. Bitcoin is careening towards you know, 40, 50, 60 k. Um, we actually lowered our lo our loan to value ratio, so the value which will extend a loan uh, in comparison to the collateral value from 50 percent to 40 percent. And it's remained there ever since. Uh, we haven't re-increased re it, uh, but that was that was one of those moves you make. You know, you feel like it's in the the company's interest and the client's interest to help protect their Bitcoin. You don't know exactly how people are going to react or see that kind of a thing. Um, and I was shocked and, and pleased that the you know the responses we got from clients. Many of them were like, "Oh, you know, Unchain gets this." Or you know, a lot of our clients are long-time Bitcoin holders. It's not their first rodeo. They know that you know what goes up can just as well come down um, and in stark fashion. And so they. Um, they applauded that that kind of move, or you know, looked like a like a sound move on our part. So you guys are headquartered in Austin, Texas, um, and are, are you know famously sort of this um, at the heart of uh, this movement to make Texas um, a global leader in, in the Bitcoin economy. Um, was that an intentional step, or that that just happened out of the Unchained meetups, um, the Bit Devs meetups in Austin? Um, Talk a little bit more about about that. So, you know, it's somewhat of organic development. You know, Drew, my co-founder, and I. You know, we found ourselves in Austin. Uh, uh, we got into Bitcoin in 2013. Only started, uh, you know, really working on a chain by about 2015 and 16. But um, I'd say at that time, you know, it's something one of those like just strokes of luck. Uh, two of our earliest employees, folks like Velvet Campbell and Parker Lewis, they were, you know, within a one or two mile radius radius of us in downtown Austin. And they were already thinking about Bitcoin and custody and lending models and financial services at that time. And so um, I'd say we just, you know, we're really fortunate to be at the right place, right time for uh, getting to work with some of the best collaborators you could hope for on, on building something like Unchained. And, uh, you know, by about 2018 or so, 2018, 2019, a lot of the, the meetups that like, I've really been you know, fired up through the 2017 bull run. I kind of um, uh, sort of sunsetted, or you know, there wasn't the interest or the attendance. But um, you know, Parker Lewis, our head of business development at the time, was was keen on uh, us hosting our the, the bit devs, you know, which had back then you know maybe only like eight to twelve people um, that were kind of coming to the office for that. Uh, but then over time, yeah, I mean, that was peaking, you know, a lot in like 2021 or so. 
Uh, and now down the hall at the uh, Bitcoin Commons here, like 150 plus people uh, were, were come, would be coming to that uh, very technical discussion once a month. Um, and you've seen, you know, over the time since we started on chain and these meetups picked up that you've had people move to Austin that were already Bitcoiners. And part of that's been the attraction of the community here. Part of it's been in, some of these are actual people that work at Unchained, um, as well as the, the kind of Texas draw of being a, a low, low tax, like uh, no state income tax kind of a, a place and um, kind of from a values and sovereignty basis. And I'd say even like some of the publicity and the work that Texas Blockchain Council does to, um, you know, propose rulemaking and to um, help build the publicity around uh, Texas friendliness and, and open doors to to Bitcoin, um, that that does that kind of, you know, engenders uh, loyalty and generous people wanting to come here. And then of course the whole energy angle uh, can't can't go without being mentioned, but um, yeah, a ton of uh, interest for for people in, in being here. And I think, like, you know, we've been just super fortunate and lucky to be uh, coincidental with I think a lot of what Texas already had going for it from a, a, a Bitcoin perspective. Yeah. Well, one of these, uh, you mentioned signaling and, and kind of the, the media and PR around it. Part of it is doing just that, shining a light on the good businesses and entrepreneurs and investors that are here and trying to get them on a level playing field with, say, Silicon Valley or New York City. Um, one of those efforts that you and I talked about a long time ago, and we st still has not come to fruition, is to get the state of Texas to custody Bitcoin in some form or fashion. And so, yeah. you know, we've we've worked with the uh, comptroller's office, and and you know, there's there's sort of a lack of statutory authority there that we need to get figured out. In the meantime, though, uh, haven't this is kind of a new concept that I've been developing with somebody uh, who probably you know I think is a client of Unchained is to um, have a Bitcoin trust that um, the benefactor of which is the state of Texas and the trust, um, you know, the attorneys that manage the trust do not release the funds until the state of Texas is willing to uh, take possession of that in, in sort of a custodial uh, hardware wallet, you know, uh, type of way. And um, I think that accomplishes a similar purpose. So the whole idea is that the citizens of Texas are giving Bitcoin to this trust or to the state of Texas, um, there'll be stipulations that the state can't just immediately convert it to fiat, right? It has to have a holding period and a vesting period. Um, but uh, it's a stark contrast between the money printing that we see in D.C. or the monetary expansion, quantitative easing that uh, we can't seem to break ourselves away from. Uh, although yeah. we're sort of in a, a brief stint of uh, you know, increasing rates in the, from a macro perspective, um, that's certainly an exception to the rule of the last couple of decades. So I don't know, this is first time you probably heard of this thought, initial yeah. thoughts. I mean, I like it. Yeah. It's kind of a, um, I mean, new, like gun to the head. Maybe it's not quite the best analogy, but <laughs> yeah, very strong, like forcing function of, um, I don't, like a, a trust where you have the beneficiaries, the state of Texas and, you know, some rules around how that can be there. And then, yeah, certainly, you know, any political body like that over time, is it, you know, maybe this thing gets under Bitcoin and it's Bitcoin's, you know, in the six figures or, you know, just starts to be, you know, build up a, a really uh, positive balance and, um, you know, something that the politicians can't ignore. Um, you know, over a long horizon, I could definitely see that like flipping um, and, and motivating some people into, okay, we need to you know, take control or see that this is a, uh, um, more directly for the benefit of, of Texas. Um, yeah, I, very creative, very cool. I like that that uh, workaround. Yeah. So, so the other guy that actually is kind of the genesis of this idea. I'm not bringing up his name because he, I didn't ask him for permission to to do that. Uh, but his idea was that each of the trustees or each of the board members of the trust have to donate uh, a single Bitcoin in order to be a participant on the trust. Uh, and and you know this is going to be a negligible amount of money at first for the state of Texas. Uh, for you and I, it could be considerable, but for the state of Texas, with a uh, you know a budget surplus, this the, the last two years our budget surplus, or I guess for the next biennium, uh, is like thirty billion dollars. Um, you know, in a state budget of of many times that, um, it is a negligible amount. But I think it's more so the the signaling and the opportunity for them to realize that within their ranks, within Texans in general. Uh, that that ethos is still alive and well, 
uh, the ethos of kind of that the the risks taking comfortable comfortable with risk, comfortable with like going out there and and being an independent thinker and doing things differently and uh, taking some entrepreneurial taking the bull by the horns. I hope that expression even originated in Texas. I don't know. Maybe the video team can look up uh, and see if taking the bull by the horns was a Texas uh, expression. But uh, that's a thought that I've got. Um, Before we wrap up, though, I want to give you the chance to kind of describe the future that you see for Unchained. Um, Where is the market headed? Obviously, we don't do price predictions. (laughs) Uh, I'm sure you probably make it a general practice not to get too... Uh, deep in the weeds on price predictions. But as far as like uh, your vision for the future of Unchained, what are you most excited about? Yeah, most excited to, uh, no, I feel like the, the industry overall, um, you can set a low bar on this, but you know, being around for the long term, like that's always been the most important to us, like ensuring that we're an enduring enterprise, that we're a, a trusted brand, uh, a place that clients are when they're securing Bitcoin um, through their Unchained uh, experience and account, that they're they're expecting that might get passed on to a grandchild, uh, and so like that that kind of duration um, and enduring aspect for Unchained is very important. Um, beyond that, you know, there are some exciting things we're working on. Uh, we are thinking a lot more about kind of payments and additional uh, products we can layer onto the Unchained uh, experience. Um, we are going through uh, some, some better, some design exercises and some kind of rebranding. So be looking for a kind of a fresh look on Unchained and um, the experience over the next couple of months. Um, user experience around Bitcoin and this kind of financial service is, a, um, is an edge for us. And I think many others in the industry as far as um, creating, uh, you know, really what's novel. It's like not been, you know, traditional experience for somebody to manage their keys inside of their Schwab account or anything like that. And so... Um, a lot of folks kind of have it easy when it comes to, you know, that custodial experience, just making it look like what you're used to. Um, but for us, kind of always making it easier, supporting other Harbor wallets, supporting other ways that folks can you know, use keys. Um, and then uh, as well, you know, launching a mobile application. So no, no timing on, on that quite yet, but that's, uh, that's a, um, a bigger effort for us as well this coming year. That's great. Okay. I know I said that was the last thing, but I do have one more thing. What are your thoughts on uh, Block? saying that they're going to manufacture their hardware wallet in texas oh cool i didn't actually hear that they'd be manufacturing it here um overall really celebrate the uh the entering of that um that their product and what we call like considered the collaborative custody space um there's some design choices the hover wallet that we're studying um but otherwise yeah i mean i think it's great and cool and i think they they might have done already some mining uh work and effort here so yeah um Got like some ground game and you know on the ground um, things they're working on, you know. And I think uh, yeah, Texas already has so between the, the Apple, Samsung, Texas Instruments. I mean, I know Central Texas has quite a bit of that kind of um, hardware manufacturing and um, you know, silicon, you know, kind of manufacturing level uh, expertise and, and and capital. So cool that they would leverage some of that too. It's exciting that uh, we're kind of on the the early innings of this still and and. Um, I think the vantage point that you guys have in Unchained is, is one that's unique and one that uh, you'll be able to look back in a couple of years or, or however long and, and see sort of an interesting trajectory to the industry, uh, a first row seat, if you will. Joe, thanks for coming on the podcast. Uh, I know people can find you on Unchained. Where can they find you on Twitter and, and everywhere else? Sure, yeah. Unchained.com would be the website. My email is joe at Unchained.com if you ever want to reach me directly. And then also at Joseph Kelly on Twitter. Awesome. Thanks, man. Hey, it's Amy. Click over here to subscribe. Click over here for more content. And we'll see you next time.